Welcome to Startup Grind. Has anyone, who has never been to a conductor event ever? Who works at Aftigy? Awesome. Um, Aftigy employees should come to more conductor events. Um, well, thank you for coming. So the conductor is a partnership between UCA and Startup Junkie Consulting in Fayetteville. Everything we do is free and we exist to catalyze an entrepreneurial ecosystem um, in the whole central Arkansas region. So we have a makerspace and we do free consulting, etc. Um, but Startup Grind is a partnership with Google for Entrepreneurs. This is actually our second this is like my 26th start of grind. It's so crazy. Um, but we get influencers and people who you wouldn't typically meet um, to share their story. And it's actually our most popular event. I have been so excited about having Justin at Start of Grind. Um, so we met a long time ago. I was actually trying to think of that yesterday. But when I was a journalist and you were starting starting Apogee. So super excited to have your story tonight. So quick rundown. Um, this is going to be like a 40-ish minute Q&A between me and Justin. And then I'm going to open up to the audience. So think about what you want to ask. Um, and we highly encourage you to be social. So our Facebook is AR Conductor. Twitter is AR underscore Conductor. And our hashtag that we use is Full Steam AR. So I encourage you to talk about what you're learning, talk about how awesome Justin is, and um, we're going to get started. And I want to give a thanks to the whole conductor team. So Kaylin and Dylan, they're actually brand new conductor employees. I'm super excited to have them on the team, and uh, thanks to everyone for being here. All right, so Justin, I'm going to pass it off to you. Um, can you just start by telling us about yourself, where you're from? So it was, uh, I was born in India. Uh, my parents uh, came over, uh, I was about three years old, and we were in New York, and somehow we found our way to Arkansas. So uh, actually, one of the families that sponsored us, one of, the, one of them got a job in Arkansas, so all the families uh, moved uh, to Arkansas, and so I've been here ever since. Um, went to, uh, went to, grew up right here in Little Rock, so I went to high school at, at Subiaco. Um, I went to college at TCU and also at UALR, but I didn't finish. I was uh, a tr little bit of a troublemaker, uh, and uh, yeah, and just started and entered the, entered the job market. Yeah, awesome. So, yeah. Um, quick, sorry to interject, Kaylin or Dylan. I d do you hear the music? I think okay. I think it's coming from outside. So we don't have many events in here, and we were trying to figure out how to play music, and we started playing easy listening, so I can hear like easy listening music playing. Okay, sorry, Justin. So um, talk about in college. Yeah. So what, it, what were you wanting to be, and wh why did you decide to not finish? Um, I, I had no idea what I wanted to be. Yeah, I was, uh, I went to college pretty young. I, I had uh, skipped a grade when I was younger, and I was 16 until like a month before I graduated high school. Uh, so I went to college pretty young and just very undisciplined. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was more uh, worried about having fun. Yeah, so yeah, I had no direction whatsoever. Okay, so after college. <clears throat> so after college, as a joke around the office, but I found out at a very early age that I was a really bad employee, so I had to become an entrepreneur. Mm. Um, so, uh, but all, uh, basically, I, I went into sales, right? So sales was... Uh, something you can get into where you can make good money to where if you just hustled and you're smart you could you can make it in you didn't have to have all these credentials to get in so that was an easy way for me into the job market i uh, had a lot of success with sales and went into sales management but very soon just wanted to do something on my own so yeah. can you talk about i mean just just so i can get an, an idea of your age at that point in your life so how old were you when you started your first sales job mm, I do, 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 do. Probably 23, 24 ish. Yeah. So when did yeah. you when did you go out on your own from that? About about four or five years after that. 28, 29. Okay. Yeah. So what what was that part? Um, so that was I was doing merchant service sales. So it's very similar to being like an uh, insurance agent, setting up credit card processing for business. Set up my built up my own um, uh, book of business, and uh, had a small exit from that. Sold that book of business. And then I started the marketing business, the direct uh, marketing business, door deals, and lucky to have a small exit from that, and that's what led into Aptigy. Okay, can we go back to the, um, I want to dig into those a little bit. Mm -hmm. So how did you, talk about starting that small business, door deals? Is that what it's called? Yeah, door deals. Um, <clears throat> I had a buddy of mine that came to me while I was doing the merchant services. I was wanting to build the merchant services up to a certain amount of uh, monthly residual, and uh, I was really excited about doing that. He came to me with this idea. It was this massive uh, it was 27 inches, over two feet, two foot long door hanger with advertisements that went on all the doors in central Arkansas. 
uh, and uh, it like it just took off. I was like, I looked at that. I was like, yeah, that'll work, right? And so our pitch was, this is the only thing that's not going to end up in the mail, which ends up in the trash, mm. right? And the other thing is that we made it category exclusive. So we would go to the pizza company in Little Rock. We'd go to U.S. Pizza, and we say, you can lock out all your competition by getting on here, right? Uh, and they were like, hell yes, right? <laughs> so like U.S. Pizza was on there, and so we, would, uh, we had these zones, so that would go to 10,000 homes. And there were four zones in central Arkansas, mm -hmm. well, in, in the Little Rock. And so they were like, we want on every single one of them. And then so we're talking like damn good pies, like how do we get on? We're like, you can't until U.S. Pizza gets off, right? So we created this demand. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then we also went for really good advertisers. So the people that were on there were places where you don't normally get a discount. So we had Chick-fil-A, Wendy's, Texas Roadhouse, U.S. Pizza, these type of places, places where you don't normally get. A lot How did of you do that? Oh, you, you just hustle. I walked uh. in the door and <laughs> say, hey, check this out. And who is, who is we? Uh, I had a business partner. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, it, it's a similar theme with, every, with, with, with all of it. Like, first, it was be, being self-employed and selling merch services. It's you pick up the phone or you walk in the door. And you just got to hustle. and You got to make stuff happen. And that was the same thing with door deals. Right, so I remember we would start uh, earlier in the day. We would start at 7 a.m. and we would only, that way we could hit like dry cleaners and stuff because they were open earlier so that we didn't have to get to the rest just so that we could work longer, right? Mm -hmm. It was like you found a way to get as much work done as possible, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then starting after G is the same thing. Is like, how do you get going? It's like you pick up the phone, you go visit people and you just hustle, right? There's, there's no magic uh, potion to how you get a business going or how you get traction. Like you literally have to outwork everyone. Right? Mm. I know people don't want to hear that, but like, that's it. <laughs> right? Yes. I just read a quote and it was like talking about how successful people just wake up early. It was like, there is an extra hour in the day. You just don't sleep through it. Like yeah. that's how, yeah. um, okay. So what happened with that small business? Um, so that was, it, it just took off. It was really successful. Uh, we were making good money. It was profitable, like business, normal businesses are supposed to be. And uh, a business broker came to us and said, uh, man, people are asking about you guys. You guys came out of nowhere. Would you be interested in selling your business? And my partner and I were like, hell yes, because it was a good business, but it was a nightmare logistically to put out. We eventually got to where we were putting out 50,000 door hangers a month. Y'all right? were doing it? We hired crews. Okay. Oh, so the way we'd hire those crews is actually pretty neat. So we would go to, whether it's fraternities or church groups or whatever, and for a fundraiser, we would pay them X amount, and then their mm -hmm. volunteers would go put out the door hanger. We had 50,000 homes mapped, and so that we had these groups that were putting them out for us. Whose idea was that? Uh, that was, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You have good ideas. Yeah, yeah okay. I, that wasn't <laughs> mine, though. So that wasn't mine. Um, yeah, so where, where so, was the last so question? So someone comes. Yeah, so asked us when sell. We were like, you know, absolutely. We have no idea how this works, right? Um, and then we never heard from the guy for six months, right? So, so we didn't even think about it again. We had, we had a business to run, so we kept running a business. And then six months later, he shows up with three offers. And the only one of them was all cash. We were like, yeah, this is an easy decision. <laughs> Just take that one. And it was literally that. So then what? Uh, so then, um, so at this point, I'm married. Um, Wait, can, can we talk about that for a second? Because I was just sure. wondering that too. At what point did you get married? Uh, 2012, <laughs> um, and I started door deals in 08. Okay. Um, but I had been with Jill for like seven years before we got married. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so she was with me through all this. So no funny, funny story, and that actually leads into this. So. Um, we sell door deals, so my wife and I, we're in a good situation, actually, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, we could pay off everything. I can put some money away and go get a normal job mm -hmm. and be responsible. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, yeah, that's not happening, right? <laughs> I want to do something else. So I remember uh, going to my wife and saying, listen, I know the smart thing to do is for me to go get a job. I can get a good job at this point. And I was like, but I just want to start something else, and I'm going to have to spend probably half this money. And it'll be a while before I will uh, make any money. She was like, how long? It's like probably at least six months, right? And she was like, absolutely, I support you. So six months comes around, and I was like, hey, I'm going to have to spend the other half. <laughs> 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 and it's going to be another six months. And she was like, babe, you know, I trust you, right? Mm. So now it's, <laughs> the next point comes up, and I remember, like, it was, it's, it's not even with a straight face. I remember laughing about it. It's like, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to start using some credit cards to get this, get this thing going. And no, that's what, that's what happened, right? So, so, so talk about the, um, that's funny. Yeah. Talk about the business side of that. So, so you have this 
you took this cash offer, and then what? What was your first move from going from there to Apogee? Uh, so, was I it knew- that was 2012? When, when was that? Yeah, 2012 was the exit. Um, and I was, I once wanted to do something in software or mobile, but I wasn't a programmer, so it wasn't something like I could just go code up an app. Mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't have an idea, right? And at that time, I was like, okay, let me set up a little agency and see if I can take on web projects and get developers to, to do the work, right? And um, set that up. It was very passive, right? Just trying to see um, what we can get done. At the time, I'm starting to find out what the, what the whole startup scene is, which is very different than running small businesses, which is what I was used to. And when I say startups, I'm by like Silicon Valley style startups, right? Um, uh, that was very intriguing to me. And while I actually took on a few small projects and uh, the at that time, this goes into the Apogee story, my nephew was in kindergarten. Uh, his mom would call up my wife and I and say, hey, don't forget Aiden's got to play today or Aiden's got to play tomorrow. And we're like, you got to be kidding me. There's got to be a better way to keep up with this kid. Does this mm. school not have an app? And that question basically started this entire journey. So started looking in, it was like, you know, there isn't much out there or what's coming, um, what was out there was the incumbents that were doing other things for schools looked at mobile as, you know what, this is another way we can monetize these schools versus we should build a great solution. Mm. And so that's where we saw the opportunity and then that's when this started. Uh, do you want to keep going into the house? Well, can oh, okay, can you um, dig a little bit more into, so, okay, you, you, Talk about your foray into the startup world. Like the, when did you first realize this was even a thing? Like the entrepreneurial ecosystem. I I don't know specifically. I'm Sorry sure it was like reading, um, yeah, Y Combinator mm -hmm. stuff. Or, uh, but then there was a startup event here, uh, and it was at Hendrix, and it was I think it was like Think Big Arkansas or something. It was like in 2013, um, and Brad Feld uh, came down and spoke, and uh, I was at that event. And at the time, I had the the Aptigy idea, but hadn't gotten started. And uh, John James, um, who is an investor and a board member now, um, was uh, speaking, and he was talking about how if you have a hacker and a hustler, you could do anything. And I was like, yeah, that's me. Like, I'm the hustler, <laughs> and I had a hacker, right? Because they're taking on the projects, and I was just like, I just need to get going. So it was just, it was, it was. I didn't know exactly what to do, but it, that inspiration was was uh, was nice just to hear that from somebody else, because that's how I've always felt about everything with business. And uh, I remember I left that event and didn't even wait to hear Brad Fell speak so I could just go start working. <laughs> right? I went there to hear Brad Fell speak. Yeah, I'm disappointed I didn't hear Brad Fell speak now, but I should have uh, just stayed, right? <laughs> but so you, so you leave that event mm. to go start this, what's to become Apogee. What was the, like, do you remember going home that day? Like, what was the first thing you did? Oh, I, yeah, I, 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 my memory is not that good. <laughs> the sorts of details. So ta talk about the like then high level, the very beginning of like what did you start doing? Um, so it was about flushing out the idea, and at the time I was reading a lot of um, startup books, and there was a specific one. I think it's called the Startup Owner's Manual. It's written by a guy named Steve Blank, um, and one of the things he really talks about is that you're not going to learn anything sitting in front of a computer, right? That's not how you run a business. You got to get out and talk to your audience, and it's called customer development. And so two things. One, how am I going to, how on earth am I going to start building software or hire or manage people to build software when I've never done that myself? And then how do I keep from, this is, if you're an entrepreneur, stop, keep myself from being a delusional entrepreneur and thinking mm -hmm. that anything can work and how big it's going to be, right? Um, and so I just started setting up appointments and reaching out to people that worked at schools and just started meeting with them and just started asking them um, questions about what we were thinking about doing. So I haven't built anything, haven't started building anything, just started having conversations with different uh, tech coordinators and superintendents around the state of Arkansas. Hmm. Then what? Um, and uh, then, because so I, I had some people in family and extended family that worked in education, and they're like, okay, this is what I'm thinking about, something along these lines. Uh, what should I do? How do I reach out to these schools? They're like, yeah, so all these schools, they have technology coordinators who you want to reach to. So I started reaching out to all these techno technology coordinators, and they were all telling me why they how they wouldn't use the product. And I was like, no, nah, I'm talking to the wrong person. <laughs> so uh, I was like, I'm not getting the answer I want. And so I was like, let me go one level up and start talking to superintendents. And I started talking to superintendents, and they were just like, I see it, right? So I realized it was less about a technology decision. It's more about a vision. Right, and uh, uh, technology coordinators were worried about all the extra work this would be on them if they went with our solution, whereas the superintendent could care less. They're talking about, you know, this is how our, our uh, district needed to be uh, presented, right? Um, and so one of the things that we were talking about is that uh, 
the options out there for mobile for schools were these HTML5 apps. They were really glorified websites, had a terrible user experience, and it made sense why the other companies were doing that. They were already had these customers, uh, had these schools as customers, and this was just another way to monetize them. What they should have been doing is building, building fully native apps, focusing on the user experience to where they can actually build onto that ecosystem later. Um, and so for us, it was like, why aren't they doing that? And it made perfect sense to build a custom native app. It's going to cost you, back then, $50,000. Today, it cost you 100000 at least, right? Mm -hmm. Schools didn't have the money to do it. So it was like, how do we build a mobile framework where we can develop these native iOS and Android apps much quicker, like build a you know assembly line type uh, structure? Um, and when I started talking to the schools, what I started, the superintendents were saying, that, hey, this is great. We know everything's going mobile, but I couldn't imagine updating another system. Right. And then I go to the next superintendent, they were like, hey, yeah, this is great. We know everything's going mobile, but our staff is overwhelmed. So I kept hearing the same pain point over and over again. And I was like, yeah, this is easy. I just had the same problem in my small business. I was using one system for uh, accounting. I was using another system for proposals and another system for invoicing. And so that's when the idea for our main product, Thrillshare, came about. And mm -hmm. that was to a single place for them to manage and distribute all their content. So in our system, uh, you m take a picture of somebody, type in a message, click submit, and it automatically updates. Yeah, Facebook, Twitter, uh, your website, your mobile app can send out text messages, voice calls, all that from the click of one button, right? And so, uh, yeah, so we started building that. So talk about... Uh, because you make it sound really easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, can you just talk about like what? How did you navigate your way into you just start building this? Yeah. So I had a buddy in town that was a developer that I trusted as far as uh, getting advice from, and uh, he kind of coached me through how to look for developers. We found some developers overseas mm -hmm. uh, to develop. So it started with myself, uh, two guys from Bolivia and one uh, a designer, lead designer in Romania. So one of those guys in Bolivia and the guy in Romania are still with us to this day. And um, yeah, I started working with them on building, uh, building software. I had no idea if they were doing a good job or not. Uh, <laughs> so come to find out after the fact, some of it was okay, some of it wasn't. So. And can you talk a little bit about the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem that you were sort of introduced to at that time too? Yeah, so I think this was around the exact same time that like the Venture Center was getting going. Um, uh, what else? Um, Innovation Hub was just starting. Mm -hmm. And so there was this big push in Central Arkansas to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem or a hub and really focus on getting some startups started, right? Uh, uh, they were hoping for some good economic development to come out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, That was really helpful. Uh, Really, um, the Venture Center, I think, really introduced me and put me in contact uh, and also Innovate Arkansas with uh, the state actually has a lot of great incentives to help companies get going. Um, and I didn't know that. And also, that's where I started to meet all the angel investors and all the angel funds that existed at that time. So, so if, if someone is in the room today who is either a hustler or a, what's the other one? Hacker. Hacker. Yeah. What, what should they do first if they want to start a company? Oh, shit. <laughs> There's, um, I, I, so you don't have to make this decision really early, but there's a very big difference between running a normal business and running a startup. And startups are designed to scale extremely rapidly, and you're going to have to go raise venture capital, and you're going to have to have multiple other rounds of venture capital to do that. right? That's what we did. In no way, shape, or form am I saying that's the better way to go. Actually, it isn't. right? Um, and so the path, choosing that and choosing a normal business where it's all the stuff you actually learn in business school, right? You want to get to profitability and you don't want your expenses to be more than your, your revenue. Um, and that's, th that's a big decision you have to make because the way you run those businesses are very, very different, right? Um, and uh, so that, that's one thing. The, um, the other thing is, um, you, obviously, you've, you've got to have an idea that's going to work. Right. And uh, one thing that I didn't do a good job of in the early days is I didn't have an early team and I went about it myself. It's much easier to have uh, to, to have a good founding team. And so, for example, I had the luxury of selling a previous business to fund the initial development. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, OK, well, you funded the initial development. What do I do? Well, go find Go get a technical co-founder and they'll code for the equity. Right. So it's not like you had to have that. Um, and so I made it harder on myself in the early days. Right. And so um, find somebody else that you're going to be in the trenches with that you want to be in the trenches with for a very long time. Uh, decide to think that if you want to go more of a small business or if you would want to actually do um, an actual startup. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I think also just connecting with the um, entrepreneurial committee uh, community and 
being around like-minded people and having these conversations um, and then actually take advice and the things that you're reading like for example there's a lot of people that read books about entrepreneurship read books about business but they never implement anything they're reading right so it was like what the hell's the point of spending all that time reading right that also doesn't mean that you should implement everything that you're reading right and so it's um yeah okay yeah. perfect talk about so okay so now you have like, you start after g you have your first employee talk about the um how do you navigate getting venture funding in Arkansas and how did yeah. all that work? So, um, didn't have our first employee yet. Um, I went to raise capital. At that time, was also was a good timing. There were a handful of angel funds in uh, in central well, in the state of Arkansas. Um, I went to them with what we we're doing, and they were like, "Hey, this is great. We like you, but um, why on earth would you want to sell into schools? They don't have any money. It's going to be all this bureaucracy." And they gave me all the reasons why they weren't going to fund me. Right. Um, and they told me to go prove to us that a school will actually pay for this. And so that's what I did next. So I just started making a bunch of phone calls and cold calling and met with schools and got some people to take a chance on us. You know, that's actually pretty interesting because there's an old saying that no one ever got fired for hiring IBM. And what that means is that you go meet with somebody, a school district, you know, hires IBM to do something. If IBM messes up when the school board is asking them, Hey, what happened? They're like, it was IBM. I, you didn't, we didn't think they were going to mess up, right? Mm -hmm. But they go with a startup. The school board is like, what the hell do you think was going to happen? Right? And so there's this big risk for a superintendent to take to go with a startup. And so uh, I think one thing that really helped us is a couple of people that we met with really liked the idea of something happening in Arkansas. Right? They thought this was really cool. So uh, you have these, all these 250 something, or uh, about 250 school districts in the state of Arkansas. Every software company that they spend money with is somewhere else. Right, and they were like, "This would be cool if this could get going." And I know that them wanting something like this to happen in Arkansas is why a couple of them gave me a chance. Mm -hmm. Right, and they signed up with us, and they, it wasn't for free or anything like that. Like they were paying. Um, the, they had to mail checks to my home address. Mm -hmm. I was like, "This is where I hate that Google exists." <laughs> <laughs> they put in that address, and it's like, "See my house." Uh, I had. I think it was so obvious we were small that who did one of the schools ask me? It's like, are you brick and mortar? And I was just like, we actually uh, just moved into, and I talked to spent talk about the co-working location and the venture center oh, we had moved into. So, like, so I dodged the question a little bit and explained where we work out of. So, yeah. how long was did were you in that stage? So, uh, of not raising money to. Um, going out and getting my own customers and going back to raise money. I don't remember exactly, but I would say probably about a six month process. Mm. So I went and got customers and I went back to the investors and I said, hey, I got customers. And they were like, hey, no one's ever done that before. <laughs> no one's ever took our advice and came back. So they were, they were interested. Um, and so this was about April of 2015. So we knew that we were gonna be able to raise money. And so we hired our first employee and we started our fundraise and that was April 2015, so we're about to hit four years that we've been operating. Mm. Okay, so I, I want to ask this. I don't want to get too in the weeds, but I am curious. Like, how did you even know what what to pitch? Like, what to even put together to go pitch to investors? You know what I mean? Like, how did you know what to do? Um, so this is where I'm going to be a little bit contrarian, but there's a lot of things online, and everybody's like, okay, you want to do a pitch deck, you want to pitch investors, this is what you do. Slide one should be X, slide two should be this, slide three should be this, you know, state the problem, what's your solution, what's the market size, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, and at the time to pitch to certain organizations here, you had to be part of another organization, and those organizations would teach you how to pitch, right? Mm -hmm. Which is actually really, really great that that's, that's there. Uh, I'm hard-headed, and I was like, I need to sell this group on giving me money. It doesn't matter the order of my slides, mm -hmm. right? It matters if the, there's actual traction there. And so I did what I was good at doing. I went in front of a group, and I purposely didn't give them all the information that they wanted because that means that they would ask me later, and I was better in a back-and-forth Q&A. Uh, Q right, then going through a pitch deck, right? So if I give all the information on a pitch deck, they're like, okay, this means this, this means this. They're probably not gonna ask me, but they're still curious. But because I left all that information on, they're like, well, what about this? And then I would be able to actually explain and talk to them and it uh, worked well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so something I was really intrigued uh, whenever we chatted before, and you were talking about just, you said your foot was on the gas, basically from that moment. Yeah. Um, 
can you talk about that, like the building momentum and, and keeping that momentum going? Yes. Um, <clears throat> When you're going the startup route, the whole reason for doing this, and what you're doing is you own X, you own 100% of the company, right? Um, if you have a co-founder, you own less than that. But every time you raise money, you're selling a percentage of your ownership in exchange for that money so that you can grow faster. And if you run out of money, if you need to raise again, you're selling more. So you're getting diluted every time. But it's worth it because owning you know, 50% of something that's 100 million is better than owning 100% of something that's you know, a million or a zero, right? And, um, <clears throat> and so with a startup, you're deciding to go extremely fast versus focusing on profitability. And <clears throat> I knew that if we didn't create momentum, right, that we would end up being, this is worse than going out of business, is a never ending startup, mm -hmm. okay? Because um, you're stuck, you've taken millions of dollars from investors, you're not growing fast enough to where you can go get more money. You're not going fast enough to where you're attractive for someone to buy, and then you're just stuck in this limbo, and it's the worst thing you can do, right? It's actually better just to go out of business than to be stuck in that in that situation, because then you at least you can chalk it up as a as as a learning uh, learning process. You learn from it, you start something else, whatever. But uh, I did not want to end up in that, right? I was it was a really tough decision for me to choose to go to the startup route because I had just spent all of my me and my wife's money. Right, And so if I had done the small business route, I could have taken it slow. We hired a few people, go get a few accounts, and just take it, uh, take it slow and be really smart about it. And I was just like, that just sounds boring to me. Like, I've already done that. And so I want to try for something bigger. Is right? that, was that your thought process? Yes, like, exactly I'm, I'm just going to try to start up, like, quick growth. So thing. it came to the position where I was just like, should I even be raising money? Mm -hmm. Why don't I just be a small business? It's less of a risk and do this, but I was just like, I was... I, I would probably be bored really quickly, and I wanted to try for something bigger. So, yeah, are you I, bored I, now? Yeah, no, 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 no. This is um, good. This is good. So, okay, so then talk about that that time. So yeah. you obviously start growing. What was yeah. all that? So on the momentum thing, the point of that is, so I've I've talked to other entrepreneurs that have raised funding, and I remember I'll talk about the conversation I had with you. Is I remember talking to someone, they're like. You know, like worried because they're like, you know, I've only have nine months of runway left. I have nine months of cash, and we've out of business. So I was like, dude, you got nine months of cash? Like, I've <laughs> never had nine months of cash. Even after we raise money, we never have nine months of cash. The point of it is, is that we went so aggressively fast, and so after raising money, I twice had to write a check into the company to cover payroll, right? If you don't ever get over that hump or build any momentum, you're going to end up that never-ending startup that is just, it's just going to suck. It's, you're, uh, you're never going to get a good return for your shareholders. You're going to be miserable. Um, and so we never took our foot off the glass, gas. If, you, if a finance person came in and saw what we were doing, they would have been like, they would have went and told our investors, like, dude, get your money out of there, <laughs> right? Um, but... But what happened is we were just so aggressive and so aggressive, and what we did is we were able to create that momentum, right? We got to the top of the hill, and then um, creating that momentum is one of the hardest things in business because you have to make so many counterintuitive decisions that most people aren't comfortable doing, right? Um, Give an example. Um, hiring, when I was talking about writing those checks into the business to cover just, payroll, just a, we were, well, we a, were, we were giving example. job offers at the time. But, so that's, that's <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> No, yeah. I'm serious. Yeah, we were, Are, yeah. Anything else? I mean, something that you that you know, part of you is like, this is not what I should be doing, or this is not this is this is counterintuitive, but I know I need to do yeah, this to yeah. keep growing. So um, once you raise money, um, and you're going down this path, most likely you're basically, uh, you know, that you're probably going to have to raise money again because of how fast you're going, right? And so every time you're raising money, the amount that you're going to have to lose as far as your ownership, which is called dilution, is based on how much the next group value gives you as a valuation for your company. So in a normal business, you're getting started, you're building all this software, there's no way it's going to be perfect, you're going to have bugs and things are breaking. What do you normally do? You're like, whoa, 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 our customers are getting mad, let's step back, let's clean this up, let's fix this, right? Let's spend three months to clean up our mess, and then let's go back to selling, right? Um, that is a very smart, logical thing to do. We don't get to do that, mm -hmm. right? And the reason is, is that if sales dip for three months, there goes our next valuation next time we want to raise. Mm. Right, and so when we're having product issues, and we have uh, we built a lot of software, it's just not a good idea. You should do one thing really well. We were hard headed, um, but um, when we had those product issues, we don't we didn't get to make the smart decision of slowing down and fixing that. We increased how aggressive we were selling. So how did you fix that? You just have to figure out. You got to do everything. Okay, right? it's one of those things where people ask you, just like, hey, what's the most important thing in, in building and scaling a startup? I'm just like everything. Mm. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> you can't do one thing well, right? Um, and so that's a, that's a counterintuitive thing. Like, yeah. okay, we're in this situation. What should you do? You bring in any logical person. You bring in the best business minds. Like, okay, you got to chill out and you got to fix these issues. And if not, you're going to have mad customers, blah, blah, blah. And we actually increased, uh, got more aggressive in sales, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it ended up being the right, de right decision. We were able to manage our way through the bugs and the issues. And our sales kept always going like this. So the next time we went to raise money, people were like, this is amazing. We want to put money into you. We're going to give you a great valuation. So I have a question. Did you ever sit down and like map out like, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is where I want to be. Or was it just like. <laughs> no, no okay. I still haven't. <laughs> My team would love it if I did that. <laughs> so, and then I've, I've done it a few times, right? Like mm -hmm. we're like, okay, let's do some more planning. And then like the next week I go in, I change it. And mm -hmm. they're like, but you just, I was like, see, this is why I don't do this shit, right? It's like, because I'm going to change it. It's going to change. It changes that frequently. Mm -hmm. And the people you should ask that most to is the people. Uh, so Ashley's here. She's on our hiring. Ashley, you can raise your hand. She's, uh, she's one of the uh, recruiters on our, on our hiring team. But like literally every week I change the hiring plan. <laughs> right, so. Okay, let's talk about that. I'm really intrigued by your the team. Yeah. So you grew super quickly. Mm -hmm. You have a ton of people. Can you just talk about that whole process? Yeah. Um, April 2015, hired the first person. Right now, we're at 88 full-time people in uh, 87 in Little Rock, one in Idaho. Uh, so 88 here in the United really States. Incredible. Yeah, and uh, we have nine overseas. So we started with three overseas. That's up to nine, um, and we'll add about 50 this year. Um, I think seven this or eight year. of those, mm -hmm. seven or eight of those are already hired and we have about 40 something positions left. Yeah. Can you just dig into that a little bit more? Yeah. So you, I mean, that's a lot of people. What were they yeah. all, do, what, what are they yeah. all doing? How did you even know what, what to even, <clears throat> can you just talk about that? The original 88 or the next 50? Just hiring that many people in that amount of time. Man, we and didn't while know. also like your foot's on the gas and you're, I, all that whole I mean, process sounds I really I really good. wish I, I had these words of wisdom for all of you. But, <laughs> I mean, you just have to figure stuff out. And we were bad at hiring in the early days, right? And, and then we got in this situation where it's like we have to fill these seats. We have to grow. We've got to have more people on the phones. We've got to have more people selling. We need more developers. And then you meet these people that are more than capable of doing the work, but they're not amazing. And then you start making uh, compromises. And like, like all those mistakes you can make like that, we did, right? And so the great thing about our team is we are, we're fine with making mistakes we're really good at learning and getting better, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that's been really great about our team is that we're, we're always getting better. We're okay with making mistakes. We're, we're not okay with not working hard. We're okay with screwing up, right? And uh, what's happened is, is that we've just learned like crazy over the last three or four years. And like, you know, hiring 50 people was more than 50% of our entire staff in one year. It took us four years to get to that, right? And mm -hmm. to do that this year, like that's gonna be really challenging, but like, we are so much more confident going into that because of what we learned from the last four years. Um, we uh, Another thing that was has always worked really well for us is that we've rarely brought in experts at something to do that. We, we bring in really, really smart, talented, hungry young people that don't have experience in it. And then so when we look into something, it's a very fresh perspective. And we end up challenging the status quo on a lot of things and doing it differently. But when we do it differently, the people that experience that from the other side, it's like, who are these guys? Mm -hmm. Like, where did this come from? Right? That's that's unique. That's different. Right? So. So talk about establishing because, like, because honestly, like when you talk about hiring all these people and you're kind of figuring it out, it it like gives me anxiety because <laughs> I would I think I would be like staying up at night like writing all these random job descriptions and stuff. How did you um, like? How did you establish a culture where everyone wanted to work really, really hard, and they were okay, kind of like figuring it out with you? Um, it's one of those things you look back and you don't know what the magic, you know, ma the magic pill was or what exactly you did right. But company culture was something that was very important to us at the very beginning, and we were very deliberate about it all along, right? Like, I truly believe that it was a competitive advantage, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, can I go into the story of kind of our, our culture and yes. what we did there? So uh, culture has um, turned into this buzzword, like, you know, the cloud or big data, <laughs> right? And really what it is is the same thing as back in the days. People used to talk about mission statements and values, and they paint it up on the wall, and one of uh, Enron's was integrity, right? It doesn't matter that you just say things, right? Um, and so we were just like, 
this is really important. We are asking people to do more than just take a job with us and to really invest and find meaning in their work. And outside of sleep, right, the majority of your time is spent at work with people that you work with. And we didn't want to create this environment where we had people that are coming to work that was dreading coming to work. Mm -hmm. That was really important to us. We knew we had something really hard ahead of us. So we wanted people that were excited about that, right? Um, and so we were like, okay, we need to build a culture. What does that even mean for us? So at the time we didn't have an office, so we got together at one of the employees' house and we we're talking about what our individual values were, how that's gonna come together and form our company values and you know, all this stuff. Did this exercise and we wrote down what our values were. And then not too much, too much longer after that, I looked at it and I was like, man, this is not us, right? And we trashed it. And then uh, we did the experiment again and we tried to figure out what our company values. This time it was like a 10 page document and David wrote it, David Allen wrote this 10 page document after we had all, the, had all these discussions of what our values were and, and like dug into what each one of those things mean. And we were really happy about this, right? <laughs> like this is good um, and we believe it. And around this time I was looking uh, if you just go to Google and put in Netflix culture deck, uh, it's really interesting. Um, and one of the things in the Netflix culture deck it said is that if you're not willing to hire and fire by your values, they don't mean anything. And so I was looking at our values and I was looking at the people we have. And it's like, if somebody doesn't meet this, would I fire them? It's like, nope. If somebody just doesn't meet this, but they meet all these other ones, would I fire them? I was like, nope. It's like, all right, this doesn't mean anything. And we trashed it. <laughs> right. And we started over again. So this is how deliberate we were on the type of culture we wanted to create. And then finally, we came to what we wanted and said, we want to build a culture of thoughtfulness and performance. Right. We want you to be want you to be excited about the people that you're working with and the type of people that you were surrounding you with and um, thoughtful about how th we write code and how that's going to affect someone in rural America that's using uh, using an app versus someone that's in the city, you know, thoughtful about um, uh, how you're working with your coworker, um, but at the same time, that's all the nice, fluffy stuff. If we don't perform, we're going out of business. So I didn't want to make this just this feel-good thing. Like we're going to have to work our asses off, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then it came to the point to where I asked myself, would I be willing to fire a high performer if they weren't thoughtful? And the answer was yes, right? And so that's how we knew what we were landing on was truly us. And um, so for me, it was very important that it was authentic and. And then, so I was like, think about who I am. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yes, I, I love, I not only agree with this, like, um, like I felt like it was me, right? And so um, I think one of the things when, because culture has become this buzzword and everybody talks about it, people do it because they're supposed to and it's not usually authentic. Like, and, and then I think that's gonna end up backfiring. It's actually better not even to talk about it if it's not truly the way that you think it should be, right? And if you think you should have a culture that is just hardcore going after everything, forget about the thoughtfulness, then you should actually say that and do that and look for people that match that, even though that wouldn't be attractive to a lot of people. Like it doesn't matter, it's more important to be authentic about it. I think the reason that it's worked well for us is that we were very deliberate about the importance of it and then we were very authentic in what we rolled out. So how did you get or how do you feel like people adopted that or how did how did you how did that work um i don't know what you asked <laughs> is it a, um we okay so we tried to do things within the company um, kind of little nudges mm -hmm. right to help these things along so thoughtfulness right so that is something that people always think about ways to be thoughtful and think thoughtful things but that doesn't mean they necessarily take action on it Right. And so we wanted to nudge like when you think about it, what are the nudges that we can make to where you actually would actually act on that? Right. Um, and then with the uh, on the performance side, we never stop talking about this. Right. That's basically what it is. Like, it's like it's to the point to where I am such a broken record at the office about this, but I know I have to be. Mm -hmm. uh, we created our own culture book um, and put all the stuff in writing. We codified it. Uh, and then we regularly go back over it. And if someone is struggling, um, we actually use the culture book to talk about if they're being successful. So part of our culture book, there's uh, uh, how to succeed at Aptogy. And, like, and so these are the things that you should be doing to be successful here. So even like if we're doing a, a review with somebody that's struggling, we base it ba uh, on what is actually in our culture book because it says in there on how to succeed. And so it's one of those things that's very easy to do and you feel good about it, you've done this good thing and you put it down and you're gonna follow it and most of your people are on board with it, but we're always bringing it up over and over again uh, and we've just been very deliberate about it. And then we're also so paranoid of screwing it up, like we're on it even more, right? Mm -hmm. That's fine that over four years we're good at 80 people and we were very deliberate about it, but now, you know, so I was the messenger in the, uh, of our culture, right? And as we get bigger, I'm no longer that. 
right? It's the next layer of people and the next layer of people. And eventually it's going, the, our culture is going to be represented by people multiple levels away from me. And so we're so paranoid about screwing up what we've done well that uh, we, we just stay very deliberate. Can you talk about some of the, the like perks and things that, that are unique to Aptogene? I don't think any, I don't know if the perks are unique because um, a lot of the stuff we're just copying from other companies, right? Do uh, you incentivize people to take vacations? Yeah, so um, so there's a couple of different ways to look at this. So you have, got really popular in Silicon Valley is unlimited vacation time, right? And so with unlimited vacation time, that sounds like a great perk. What ends up happening is that uh, your high performers actually don't take time off, right? Because they want to get that next raise. They want to show how hard working there. And we believe it's really important for you to get away. Um, and so what we did was, okay, we're going to do what's called discretionary time off. So as long as you ask for it, we're basically going to prove as long as you give us enough notice. So it's pretty similar to unlimited time off. But the difference is, is after you've been there 12 months, that if you take time off to travel, we actually cover up to $1,000 of your travel expenses. So if you don't take time off, you're leaving money on the table. So we wanted to give that perk, but we didn't want to do it with the negative of we know that the high performers and the competitive people wouldn't take the time off. And when we look back at people that take time off, like it's usually our highest performers that are taking the most time off, hmm. which is awesome, right? Yeah. So that's one. Um, yeah. What else? Um, what else perks? Uh, I don't know if these are perks, but just, I mean, for a startup, we have really great corporate benefits, you know, health, uh, dental, vision, all that stuff, uh, 401k. Uh, what else? Um, what's, a, what's something good? Oh, our um, we maternity leave um, is three months, mm -hmm. right? Um, and just having a baby a year ago, mm -hmm. I could not imagine people having to take two weeks two off babies. and go back. Two babies, yeah, twins, yeah. So um, that was, uh, so yeah, we have pretty, uh, pretty strong maternity leave. Um, what else? Catered lunch every Wednesday. <laughs> so catered lunch is another thing. So it's like, like there's all these things that happen out in Silicon Valley and, you, and, you, and a lot of people copy it, but so catered lunches and a lot of companies, what they do is um, they, uh, they give you food for every single meal. Um, that is really a great part. The other side of it is it's also a way to keep you there, right? And it keeps you from leaving and keeps you from taking longer lunches and keeps you, so you stay there. Um, uh, so we've always talked about this, but that's not what we wanted. I think people should get out of the office. Like we have some real, we have really hard workers. We have people that grind away, people that work well over 40 hours, but no one's in our office after 5.30, hmm. right? And just like, you can go home. If you have stuff you gotta do, you don't have to sit here at the office and be miserable, right? And it's the same thing with the catered lunches. Like, what can we do? We were trying to figure out all these different ways where we could offer some type of a lunch incentive, but not be there, but because of different regulations and tax stuff we're just like so we just did the cater lunch once a week mm. right so we're not trying to keep people at the office by doing it we we're just trying so we're trying to figure out how to do a perk but without the side effect gotcha. and the same thing with the time off right and do it without the, the 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 natural side effect that happens from it i think that you're humble but you have really good ideas okay. well thank you, you. Had, cool. I, yeah that's an underpinning to all of this yeah um Okay, before I open it up, can you talk about um, being a dad of twins? And I'm a twin, so I love twins. Uh, um, but, and how has that changed your um, life as a CEO and founder? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I got one year old twin girls. Uh, it's freaking amazing. Um, yeah, uh, how has it changed? Um, I don't know, so my happy hour time changes now. The, so it, it used to be right after work at five o'clock, and now it works better for me to go home, put the girls to bed, and then do it at 7.30, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, man, I, I, I don't know. I guess uh, it's something that my, my wife and I were wanting kids for a while, and um, so we were ready and excited for it. Um, I don't know how, I'm sure it's changing me, and I'm sure I'll look back at some point and see that, but, uh, but for me, it's just something that we were really excited about all along, and um, and it's just it's just been amazing, right? Um, I was just talking to Elise earlier um, about uh, about this that um, when yeah, I don't know, I don't know what I want to say, but uh, <laughs> it's it's all the cliche things, right? And um, we're. I am very, very lucky, right? And so when you, what I was talking to Lisa about is that when you think about what you're doing in your life and you're just like, okay, if I had a magic wand and I could be doing anything right now, what would I do? And like, I'm literally getting to do that every day, 
right? And then, and so I've always thought about that from the work side. Like if I could be doing anything, I, I wouldn't change it. Like I'm getting, I love business. I'm getting to run a business. And now because of how successful we are, uh, that we've been, I want to say, <laughs> that we also have plenty of money to mm-hmm. do it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so now that's actually uh, transitioned over into the family side as well, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So when, at what point did you kind of look up and you were like, oh my gosh, I did it? Like we're... Yeah. I haven't and I'm not <laughs> going to. Yeah, I haven't done anything. The more successful we are, if we screw up, the fall is going to be that much bigger, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not... Uh, yeah, we haven't, we, haven't, uh, we haven't done anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, like, yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to open up for questions. Who wants to start? Mm-hmm. So you talked a lot about being a startup and being in that mentality and the exponential growth that comes alongside it. Do you believe you're still in the process of being a startup or do you believe you've hit the point where you can consider yourself a traditional business? Uh, so, uh, very good question. Um, I think that we're definitely still a startup, right? And so, um, and it just depends on who you're talking to as far as what the definition of a startup is, right? Um, but we don't have everything figured out. We're still trying to figure things out. We are not more focused on processes and organization and efficiency over creativity and growth. We're still focused on that. Um, so I think that we're very much still a startup and I think that we will be for a while. Yeah. So I loved your comments about culture um, 100%. Uh, really, really appreciate your thoughts on that. You spoke specifically about high performers and thoughtfulness. Can you dive into what thoughtfulness means in the context of Baptist culture a little bit? Yeah. So, um, it, well, like, where did that even come from, right? Thoughtfulness. And I was just like, there were certain people, I don't want to name names, but there were certain people that I would meet with and Anytime I would leave meeting with these people, there was this feeling that I had. It was like, what the hell are they doing that's making me feel this way? Like, that's what I want replicated. That's what I want with the people I work with. And we're just like, okay, they're, you know, they're considerate or they're empathetic and all the empathetic and empathy and compassion, right? The words thrown around like crazy, right? And just like, and I just can't remember, keep thinking about this. And I was just like, I don't know how to articulate this, but there's this feeling I get when I meet with certain people. And just like, when I was just like, and it was just something as simple as these people are extremely thoughtful, right? And it was so, it was like, I was left with this feeling because of how thoughtful these people were. And that's the feeling that I wanted everyone else to be left with and with the people that they work with, but also with the clients, right? And so it means a lot more on all these different levels, but that's where that thinking came from, right? And, and so it was like, I was actually experiencing these feelings with certain people and it was having a hard time articulating what that was. And then when I really figured it out is that it was something as simple as thoughtfulness. But I say simple as often as that's actually really hard to do, right? Uh, and so when you're performing and you have these tough decisions, you have all this work to do, it's very hard to be considerate of everybody around you. And so we really like uh, that push and pull of our values, right? It should be that difficult. It's very difficult to be high performing and thoughtful all the times. And that's what we were looking for. Um, another thing about uh, culture and values is that if you have a list of values and you think that you've hit them all, then they, it was too easy. You're not going to accomplish anything, right? So this is something that we struggle with. It's really hard, but that's exactly how it should be. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Do you have a question in the back? Yeah. Messengers. Hey. Uh, question about being sort of a serial entrepreneur. So Kim has mentioned several times you have great ideas. Being in, in innovator mode for, for specific uh, Apogee's uh, strategy, what do you do with your good ideas that don't fit into your current business model? Um, can I give a really long answer to this? <laughs> um, so I think this is the most important part of business. Okay? I think processes are easy. I even think more times than not strategy is easy. I think that you could go get really sharp seniors at any local high school and bring them in and tell them all the situations you have and they could lay out a clean process for you. The hardest thing about business is creativity and originality. Mm-hmm. Okay? That is the most hard thing. And the thing is that no one has ever implemented a framework. This is how you come up with a creative idea. This is how to be original. If they knew that, <laughs> they would do it, right? That's the most difficult part of business. When you're a startup, you're competing with really large companies that already have all these processes. They already have these efficiencies. They already have the top of their class MBAs and the finances in order. If that's what you're doing, you're going to get killed, right? 
your competitive advantage has to be in how you're going to be different, how you're creative and how you're original. Okay. So some of the things, so that is why we are successful. All the other stuff is great and we do a lot of things well, but when we went to the market, people told us you can, it's so difficult to sell to schools. They don't have money. It's going to be six to nine month sales cycle. There's going to be all this bureaucracy. Everything they told us, nothing's been true. Right, because we went to the market in our own way. So in the very early days, people were telling us, this is how you sell into schools. And we very quickly said, well, well I don't wanna hear anymore. We're gonna go do our own thing and see what happens. And what we did is the way that we approached the market and the way we sold was so different than anything they seen, we created intrigue. And so they were just like, wait, who the hell are these guys? What is this? This is so different, right? And so for everything that we do. So in the early days, what we did is we create custom videos that we send out to prospects. And so we have a studio and you go in front of the studio and you're just like, hey, Kim, I was just on your website and I saw that Christy won second place at the math competition and I love how you're sharing these positive stories and blah, blah. So we shoot these videos and what's we send to superintendents? Superintendents do nothing but put out fires all day, right? And now we sent them a video, custom video to them, and it is talking to them about all the positive things that's happening at their district. We're shooting 156 videos a day, and then we're putting them in cold emails that may not even get opened, right? If you build out a model and you spreadsheet this out, okay, the time it takes, the research it takes, the man hours it takes to build all these videos, to put it out there, and most of these won't ever even get watched, the model tells you this makes no sense. That's what we look for. We're looking for things that make absolutely no sense to do because that is evidence to me that the competition won't do it. Right? If the competition won't do it, then we're going to stand out. Right? And so with these ideas, what we're looking for is how creative of an idea is it if we actually tried to build a model on, 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 on the effectiveness of this or how much it would cost to do it, we actually want it to not make sense. And this came, uh, this was for me, was, there was an essay I read in the very early days by a guy named Paul Graham called Do Things That Don't Scale. Right? So when you're a, a, a uh, a startup and the whole point of everything you're doing is to scale really fast, right? You think that, okay, I have this idea, but I can't do it because I won't be able to do that when we're 100 clients or 500 clients. We looked for ideas that didn't make sense and, and wouldn't scale, right? And so we did really great in that, so we stood out, right? And so now we create custom printed booklets to send to a school district showing them all these changes that we can make for them. So again, we couldn't find a printer to do it. And if we could use something like Shutterfly, but it'd be a five-day turnaround, all this stuff. So we ordered our own printing equipment, right? So it's not scalable to the point where we had to order our own printing equipment, right? Um, and it's, again, it makes us stand out. It creates intrigue, and we stand out amongst all of our competition. When we look at, we're printing all these uh, booklets and sending them out to people that have no idea who we are. They're not even going to open this. Does it make sense to do it? Probably not. That's what we're looking for. We didn't do many conferences in the past. Right? Everybody, if you're getting started, let's go to all the trade shows, let's go to all the conferences. We're like, we want to stand behind a damn table and try, and try to make eye contact with people that are trying to avoid eye contact with us. <laughs> right? So we weren't about to go start doing that, so we're like, okay, how do we be creative? So now we created booklets for everybody that's going to, that's going to be at the conference. And so we would tell them, and then so people would come to see their booklet, and when somebody comes to our booth, we go grab them. We were giving them a custom booklet that was already made for them completely different than any experience that they're having with anybody else. We were just at a conference in LA and we're doing this and at our booth there's all these people coming to our booth getting stuff. We look at all the other booths around there's no one there, right? Mm. And then so how do we get this out? So we sent a few of our people to LA to shoot a video on what superintendents should do while they're in LA. And then at the end of it, we're like, come by and get your, we made this custom booklet for you as well. So we went and reviewed restaurants. We went and uh, we had our VP of sales go and get a, a um, a Manny Petty, and if you know him, you, you don't expect him to do this, and we got discounts. For, and so these superintendents get this, gets this video on what to do in LA when they're there for a few days, right? And so there was a, a lot of easier ways we could have done that. We could have just made a PDF and sent them, hey, this is what we researched and things you could do, but instead we made a full video and sent a crew out there to do that. They look at us and they're like, this is amazing. So we had so many superintendents reach out to us about, oh, I went to that restaurant you recommended. I went, to, you know, I went and got my nails done. I went and did this. Um, but then the whole point of that was we're printing all these books. So we took 1,000 booklets with us to LA to, to give out, but it drove the traffic to do it. So you think about printing 1,000 booklets. You have no idea who's going to come by and pick it up. It's not something that's scalable. If you build out a spreadsheet at the end, it would say this makes no damn sense. 
right? And so for us, we are looking for things that make no sense to do, and we're willing to do it because that's what separates us. And the hardest thing about business is not process, is not efficiency, is not finance, it's creativity and originality, and that's what we focus on, and that's what, that's what we're good at, but we gotta make sure we don't mess up and stay, um, stay good. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, one more question. You gotta do a quick call out on that one. The original question was, what do you do for the things that don't fit the business model? You just uh, don't <laughs> do them. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the other part of that, so uh, yeah, on that is that, man, we go through a lot of ideas to pick one thing that we actually do, right? And so with the LA video thing, I'm going to the marketing team and saying, let's come up with, uh, let's think about experiential marketing, what can we do to stand out? There were all these great ideas, but it wasn't the right one, right? And so. Were those coming from within the company? Like, where yeah. are these coming from? Yeah. Within the company, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do y'all just do, like, massive whiteboard sessions and? No. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is also just part of, like, the kind of culture and environment that you're creating, right? We're always looking to push the envelope. We're always pushing to do something different and how can, what can we do to stand out? Again, that's more important for us. And what this leads to is that there's some chaos around the processes and things like that, but we're like, that'll get fixed in time. We're not worried about that. That's not what's gonna make us successful or uh, be the difference between success or failure. But approaching the market differently, that is going to be the designer, mm -hmm. right? Okay, one more question for real. Any more? I got one. Um, so you said that you kind of stumbled upon your need for the company. Uh, I'm basically asking for like the college students that are wanting to come out and start their own businesses. What is some advice you could give for us to kind of find a need? Um, kind of a framework to find a need. Um, one of the easiest places, two easiest places to find a need is something that you have experience in and you see the inefficiencies in it and see if there's a way that you could solve for that, right? And I don't, so if you have a job at a restaurant or if you have a, or whatever a part-time job is or something that you're experiencing while you're in college, like, man, this process is really inefficient. There's probably something we could do there. Um, the, um, that is uh, probably the best place is you actually experiencing something, right? And so if you're in a fraternity or sorority and you're just like, man, the communication between this, you know, there's, it's really terrible. I bet there's a better way that this could be done, right? So it's looking for a pain point that you experience in your life, right? Um, whether you have experience in it or not, right? And so when I felt this pain point, I was like, there's gotta be a better way to keep up with this kid at this school not have an app. I had never done anything in education. I dropped out of damn college and I'd never been a programmer, <laughs> right? So I had zero experience in any of those things, right? And so uh, one thing that's really important is you don't have to be an expert in the field that you're trying to do something in. A lot of people will tell you do something in that. I actually think that when you have a lot of experience in something, mm -hmm. you see how things are and what you end up doing is you're like, oh, these could be approved and you end up making 10 and 20% incremental improvements on what's there. Versus me, I had no idea what schools had, I didn't care, so I did it my own way. So what we took to market was so different when it was really a very simple idea, right? So throughout your entire life, there's something that's happening where you're just like, man, this is inefficient, or man, this is frustrating. How do you go solve that problem, whether you have experience in it or not? Can you, um, you touched on this a little bit, but especially for college students, talk about the importance of, okay, well, you, you've identified a problem but validating that problem, and you clearly did customer discovery, and can you just talk about that process for a second? So that's a really difficult one, because this is probably where I'm probably gonna give you bad advice, right? Um, the, because that is exactly what you're supposed to do, but if I followed what I heard, I wouldn't have done this business, hmm. right? And so the market actually told me, no, we don't want this or that, but I was actually asking the wrong people, right? And, and uh, But I didn't know I was asking the wrong people, right? And so my hard-headedness actually helped me uh, through on that. Um, so, but be careful that, especially if you're a coder, if you're gonna do software, is that you're not gonna learn anything sitting in front of a computer, right? So if you're out in the market, when, you, when I say do customer discovery, is whether you, I took all the advice I heard or not, I was still getting data points. It was still another piece of information I was gathering and that's why that's, that's so important. So get out from in front of your computer and go talk to the market and gather as much data, but then still have the confidence to make your own decisions. Based, and so sometimes it might match some of the data you see, and sometimes it might become something completely different. Awesome. So we always end on the same question. Okay. Um, if you uh, could pick one piece of business advice to leave us with, what would it be? Do things that don't scale.
Do things that don't scale. Do things that don't scale, yep. If you're gonna do a startup. Awesome. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I have to, to say that, you know, I um, almost got emotional when you were talking about the whole culture piece because there is so much research that so many people hate their jobs, like 85% of people hate their jobs. And I think it's really incredible that you have created so many jobs for people in Arkansas and a, a culture that people love. Yeah. I mean, that is not to be taken lightly. So, and you are very humble, but thank you for doing that. Thank you. Um, so let's give it up for Justin.